So happy to see each of you as we come back today, uh, Saturday, to do Jeremiah. All right. We're on page 22 in the uh, on our notes. All right. And I'm going to ask Rita to read to us the first three verses. Jeremiah 43. Verses one to one to three. And it came to pass that when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking unto all the people, all the words of the Lord their God, for which the Lord their God had sent him to them, even all these words, then spake Azariah the son of Hoshiah and Johanan the son of Korea, and all the proud men, saying unto Jeremiah, Thou speakest falsely. The Lord our God hath not sent thee to say, Go not into Egypt to sojourn there. But Baruch the son of Neriah setteth thee on against us, for to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, that they might put us to death and carry us away captives into Babylon. <clears throat> All right. There were many proud men among these leaders of those remaining in the land. They did not like being confronted by Jeremiah with their hypocrisy as Jeremiah had done in Jeremiah 42, 20. Would you read that for us, Rita? Jeremiah 42, verses 20 to 21. For ye dissembled in your hearts, when you sent me unto the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us unto the Lord our God, and according unto all that the Lord our God shall say. So declare unto us, and we will do it. All right. He, he you know, he faced them right head on. Uh, he wasn't afraid. And uh, they had promised, please, you seek God and tell us what the, answer is and we'll do whatever he tells us to do and now after waiting for 10 days uh, he got the answer from the lord and then when he spoke it to them uh they said you speak falsely the lord our god has not sent you all right and you to say what you did all right it's really remarkable that these men who lived through the tragic accuracy of every word of Jeremiah regarding the sin and judgment of Judah would now say he was a false prophet. Everything he had said before came to pass exactly the way that he said it. And now just because he comes back with an answer that they didn't want to hear, they asked God, should we go into Egypt or not? They had already made up their mind what they were going to do. They were, they had already decided they wanted to go, but they just wanted to have it confirmed that God agreed with their plans. No, God doesn't need to agree with any plans. God knows the end from the beginning. And we should never Ask God what he wants if you've already made up your mind. Uh, you know, uh, I remember this one time when I was seeking the Lord to find his will. Lord, show me, show me what is your will about this matter. And the Lord finally said to me, you know, I, I heard it in my spirit, said, if I show you, do you plan to say yes to it? Or are you just wanting to know it and then decide whether it is, you know, sounds good to you that you like it and then you'll say yes. If you don't like it, you'll say no. No, God is God. And once we ask him to show us his will, we have to be willing to say yes, regardless of it. But these men had already made up their mind. And so to ask God, they were so sure that God would agree with them to go down into Egypt. But uh, that was not the way that God wanted. All right. Um, 
all along they realized they had regarded God as a power to enlist. In other words, cry out when you need him, uh, when you don't know what to do and so forth, but not a Lord to obey. And uh, they still could not believe that his will could be radically different from their own. They were so sure that they were right. They just w felt it would sound better if they asked God and then God's will came out to be the same as theirs. But uh, we need to understand this. In fact, um, you know, they blamed, they accused Jeremiah of not bringing a word from Yahweh, but uh, from the Babylonians. They said it was all planned to bring about either their death or captivity in Babylon. That, you know, Baruch, uh, had told them what and and that that in other words he was on ba the Babylonian side they wanted to get away from the Babylonians you remember uh, the Babylonian captain of the forces Nebuzaradan had left them in charge of Gedaliah and Gedaliah had been murdered and um, all the people there were m murdered, all those within the, and, and, you know, in the end, this Johanan just said, you know, they're going to find out and uh, let's just get out of here. And they took everybody, all right, and um, insisted that they had to go with them, read for Verses four to seven. Yes. Jeremiah 43, verses four to seven. So Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces and all the people obeyed not the voice of the Lord to dwell in the land of Judah. But Johanan, the son of Korea, and all the captains of the forces took all the remnant of Judah that were returned from all nations whither they had been driven to dwell in the land of Judah, even men and women and children and the king's daughters, and every person that Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had left with Gedaliah, the son of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, and Jeremiah the prophet, and Baruch the son of Nereah. Verse 7, So they came into the land of Egypt, for they obeyed not the voice of the Lord. For thus they came even to Hephanes. All right. Now, it, it says that they would not obey the voice of the Lord to remain in the land of Judah. God wanted them to stay there and trust him to look after them. God knows the future. We don't. They wanted to run away. They, they felt like, yeah, the king of Babylon is going to hear about this. And he's going to come and he's going to get us. He's going to either murder us or he's going to drag us away to Babylon. And they, with their own imagination, figured out what they thought was the thing. All right. And even though they had promised to do what God told them to do, and God told them to trust him and remain in the land, Johanan, and the other leaders and all the people did not keep their promise and decided to go to Egypt uh, for their protection and for their provision, all right? Uh, one person says the arm of flesh, which is Egypt, seemed a greater guarantee of safety than the arm of the Lord. But I'm here to tell you, it doesn't matter how dangerous it seems, if God has really spoken, we can trust what he says far more than any human leader or human uh, natural country, all right? It doesn't matter what it looks like to our natural eye. Uh, to trust in the Lord is far better, all right, uh, than to trust in the outward appearance of things. And so what they did was they took 
by force everyone else, all right, other than their own group, which believed in them. If, if you remember right, as soon as uh, the king of Babylon had defeated and defeated Zedekiah and taken that last group away, he left just these others there and Gedaliah was put in there as the governor to watch over them and to look after them. And Gedaliah was quite different than Zedekiah or any of the other royal seed that had come to the throne. They Outwardly, they were subjected to the king of Babylon, but inwardly they rebelled against him and they did all sorts of things against him but Gedaliah was not like that and um, he accepted the post that they gave him and uh, the position and he he was a believer in God he was not one to do his own will but we know uh, he was murdered and taken away now these that don't want to listen to God all right uh, oh I started to tell you when all this takes place before Gedaliah dies, then the different ones that have left um, Judah, you know, to get away from the Babylonian conquerors, they had gone to the different neighboring countries. But when they finally saw that everything had quieted down, yes, um, Jerusalem was burnt. Uh, and, you know, destroyed, but there was a, a good man, Gedaliah, that, a governor, to watch over them. They slowly came back from these other countries to live and dwell. Remember, we also said Gedaliah had told them, you can go into the area, all the people have gone, there's nobody to take care of the crops and things. So you can go and you can gather whatever you can of the harvest so it doesn't go to waste. So actually life was very, very good for them there. And so these people from other countries, they were also Jews and had run away when they thought that uh, Babylon was coming in. Now they find it's quite peaceable and things look good. So they have all come back again as well. So we have not only the ones that were left with Gedaliah, but these others that came and Johanan and uh, those that were with him. All right. It says all, he took all the remnant of Judah, men, women, children, and Jeremiah the prophet and Baruch. All right. It wasn't enough for Johanan and the people to disobey God, they also took by force everyone else, whether they wanted to go or not, forced them to come with them into Egypt. And so they went into the land of Egypt. In a sense, they took Jeremiah and his associate uh, Baruch as hostages against the Lord, all right? against God. Since the Lord promised judgment against all who went to Egypt, uh, they virtually dared God to judge his faithful prophet, who they dragged down to Egypt. All right. And yes, um, he never did come back again. Uh, actually, he died in Egypt. He didn't die by the Babylonians. He didn't die by the Egyptians these rebels themselves uh, killed him while he was there. It, it's sad that he was so faithful to God, uh, but it just shows what kind of a heart they had. It, it was very self-centered, self-determined, and uh, they had no concern for anyone else, all right? And uh, they got very angry with him 
because he went ahead and told them uh, what God told him. Now, we need to stop and think. If he, you know, uh, didn't, he wasn't afraid of telling King Zedekiah, he wasn't afraid of telling Zedekiah exactly what God has said. Why should he be afraid of telling these uh, people, uh, you know, that they're not the king, they're not royalty? Um, why should he be afraid to tell? Because he, what God was saying to them, and the reason is he wasn't worried about his own life. He was just being faithful to God to verse and voice what God wanted him to say. All right. Abraham's descendants returned to Egypt. All right. This is what one commentator said long after uh, liberation from it. With great suffering, they had been delivered from the bondage in Egypt, only to return there a defeated and hopeless remnant nearly 900 years later, all right? God did not want them going back there. He said he would take care of them if they stayed, even though those that he allowed for judgment's sake to you know, go to Babylon, that they would be there 70 years. He did promise them those, the good figs. Remember, there were two baskets of good figs. Those were the first two deportations, all right? Daniel was in the first, and Ezekiel was in the second. Those were called the good figs. And God said those would, God would make a way for them to come back to Judah and come back and bless the land of Judah and stay in the land of Judah, all right? But Zedekiah was the last group and they were known as the bad figs. And sure enough, Zedekiah died in Babylon. He never did get to come back, all right? Now it tells us that they went as far as Toponese, all right? This, um, they halted at this place, most probably for the purpose of obtaining the king's permission to penetrate farther into Egypt. It was at this place that according to St. Jerome, tradition says the faithful Jeremiah uh, met his end. Uh, there's all different ways of how he died, and I'm not going to suggest here um if you want to go look it up yourself they don't really know for sure and since the bible doesn't say it um it's just that he never got to leave all right uh he suffered every kind of hardship and now he sealed the truth of his divine mission with his own blood but not by the babylonians all right uh, read 8 to 9. Jeremiah 43, verses 8 to 9. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah in Tepanis, saying, Take great stones in thine hand, and hide them in the clay of the brick, brick kiln, which, which is at the entry of the Pharaoh's house in Tepanis, in the sight of the men of Judah. So the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah in Toppenes, all right? Jeremiah was no longer in the promised land, and God commanded his people who remained after the Babylonian exile to remain in the land. By force, Jeremiah was taken to Egypt. Yet the word of the Lord still came to him. He was still God's prophet. And God did not count him as disobedient because of the terrible circumstances, how he was forced to go into Egypt, all right? Um, he was told to take these large stones and hide them. God commanded Jeremiah to do the same kind of thing that he had commanded him to do in Judah, to do something that would illustrate and memorialize uh, 
the prophet's word, God commanded Jeremiah to take these large stones and hide them or bury them at the entrance to Pharaoh's house. Uh, precisely on the spot in front of the royal residence, Nebuchadnezzar would assert his sovereignty over Egypt and would be doing so at God's command. All right, um, 10 to 11. Verses 10 to 11. And say unto them, Tassel, Sorry, sorry, 10 to 13. 10 to 13. And say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will send and take Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will set his throne upon these stones that I have hid. And he shall spread his royal pavilion over them. And when, and when he cometh, he shall smite the land of Egypt and deliver such as are for death to death and such as are for captivity to captivity and such as are for the sword to the sword. And I will kindle a fire in the houses of the gods of Egypt and he shall burn them and carry them away captives. And he shall array himself with the land of Egypt as a shepherd putteth on his garment. And he shall go forth thence in peace. He shall break also the images of Bethshemesh that is in the land of Egypt. And the houses of God, of the gods of the Egyptians, shall he burn with fire. Now, I, I'm going to read this first uh, line. Um, I will send and bring Nebuchadnezzar. The, the, the emphasis isn't on Nebuchadnezzar, but I will send and bring Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. So we see that God promised that he would bring Nebuchadnezzar to conquer and judge Egypt. Now they went down into Egypt to get away from Babylon. But God is telling them, I am going to send, and Nebuchadnezzar is my servant. In other words, he's not doing his own will. This is my will. He's going to go down and he's going to conquer Egypt, all right? And the same thing that I wanted him to do here in Judah, I'm going to have him do in um, Egypt as well. And he says, Nebuchadnezzar was going to set his throne. In other words, once he came in, once he conquered, he would set up his throne right above where these stones to let you know that this is the word of the Lord. Uh, he foretold exactly what was going to happen and the very place that it was going to happen. All right. In the courtyard of Pharaoh's palace. All right. Um, He said, I will kindle a fire in the houses of the gods of Egypt. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar would do this when he got there, but it was God's will. It was God's plan and God enables him and makes the way for him to do it. All right. Um, and through the Babylonians, there would come death, captivity, and the sword, and they would destroy and loot the Egyptian temples. The message was very clear. If they went to Egypt to escape wrath and the power of Babylonians, it would follow them there. It was better to stay in Judah and trust God to protect and to provide. And he said, it's going to be just as a shepherd puts on his garment. In other words, it's not going to be a hard thing. It's going to flow very easily. It will take place as simply and as easily as when a shepherd, you know, puts his outward garment on, all right, with much ease and little opposition, uh, the full confidence that is now 
his, all right, Nebuchadnezzar's, all right, he'll take over Egypt. Now, they have other thoughts, um, uh, some of the other renderings, but I'm not going to go through them, all right? Let's, um, we're, we're going to, right now, it is 928, we're going to just give me time to move to the next chapter, all right? So if you look on page 22 of your notes, there was rebellion against Jeremiah. There was the refusing of the word of the Lord. Um, all right. And retribution by Jeremiah's uh, prediction, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, con con conquest of Egypt was foretold by a type hiding those great stones. All right. And Nebuchadnezzar will visit upon Egypt. All right. The terror of war burning idol temples, subjugating the entire country, all right, and breaking the images of Bathshemesh, all right, which was the house of the sun. Now we're going to start on chapter 44. The prophet's final plea to Egypt, all right, one to six. Jeremiah 44 verses 1 to 6. The word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews which dwell in the land of Egypt, which dwell at Migdal and at Tampanis, Tampanis and at Nor and in the country of Petros, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, You have seen all the evil that I have brought upon Jerusalem and upon all the cities of Judah. And behold, this day they are a desolation and no man dwelleth therein because of the wickedness which they have committed to provoke me to anger in that they went to burn incense and serve other gods whom they knew not, neither they, yea, nor your fathers. How be it I send unto you all my servants, the prophets, rising early and sending them, saying, Oh, do not do this, oh, do not this abominable, abominable thing that I hate. For they hearken not, nor incline their ear to turn from their wickedness, to burn no incense unto other gods. Verse 6, Wherefore? My fury and my anger was poured forth and was kindled in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, and they are wasted and desolate as at this day. All right, so the word that came to Jeremiah concerning all the Jews who dwell in the land of Egypt, Jeremiah 42, described how the captains of those remaining Jews in the land um led all they could to Egypt, even against their will, and God's, uh, it was also against God's command. Jeremiah was among those that were brought by force to Egypt, and he spoke this word to the Jews in Egypt, all right? The Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, God began this word to these displaced Jews, by declaring two of his names. He remained the Lord of hosts, the God of powerful armies. He remained the God of Israel, even though at that time, Israel did not even exist as its own kingdom. That's the Northern Kingdom. These things uh, that did not appear to be were nevertheless real before God and in his plan. And he tells them, he says, you've seen all of the calamity. You've seen all that I've brought upon Jerusalem and the cities of Judah. So God was reminding his people now 
in Egypt, why judgment came on Judah. It came from God himself because of their wickedness, which they had committed. It says to provoke me to anger, all right? By turning to other gods, by leaning on other gods, by serving other gods, instead of listening to him and obeying him. And it said, they have provoked me to anger, especially with their wickedness in idolatry. God sent his prophets to instruct and to warn the people. He said, rising up early, all right, but they did not listen. Their sin, especially idolatry, was bad enough, but their refusal to be corrected was fatal. It was going to bring to those that were like that the, the very end, all right? Um, they will be wasted and desolate from God's judgment because they refuse to take correction. You know, God is very gracious to his people. And if we're willing to take correction, he can turn away and, and make the judgment a, a little bit lesser, all right? But when we refuse to be corrected. We refuse to listen to what God tells us. There's no hope at all. We will face complete uh, desolation and um, total death. That's it. Uh, and for time and eternity. All right. I'm going to read you something that Spurgeon wrote. All right. Um, Oh, says someone, sin is a sweet thing. No, no, it is an abominable thing uh, because God had said, oh, do not this abominable thing, which I hate. All right, so we have to see sin as really abominable. That means very hateful in the eyes of God. God hates it. All right. Um, oh, this is going back to Spurgeon, but it is a fashionable thing. You can see it in the courts of kings and princes and great men of the earth. They love it. Even though they do, it is an abominable thing in the eyes of God. Though it should crawl up to the monarch's throne, spread its slime over crown jewels, it would still be an abominable thing because God said it. He said that word, oh, do not do this abominable thing that I hate, all right? Beware of bringing pain into the heart of infinite love, but ask that some of God's hate for sin may be yours, all right? Um, don't just say, Lord, teach me your ways, all right? Just put it in plain language. Lord, may your hate for sin come into my heart. May I see it the way you see it. May I yield myself to your work in my heart and life and realize you hate sin. It's abomination in your sight and uh, help me not to want to do it. Read verses seven to 10. Jeremiah 44 verses seven to 10. Therefore now thus saith the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, Wherefore commit ye this great evil against your souls, to cut off from you men and women, child and suckling, out of Judah, to leave you none to remain, in that you provoke me unto wrath with the works of your hands, burning incense unto other gods in the land of Egypt, whither you be gone to dwell, that you may cut yourselves off that you might be a curse and a reproach among all the nations of the earth? Have you forgotten the wickedness of your fathers, 
and the wickedness of the kings of Judah, and the wickedness of their wives, and their own wickedness, and the wickedness of your wives, which they have committed in the land of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem. Verse 10, they are not humbled even unto this day, neither have they feared, nor walked in my law, nor in my statutes that I set before you and before your fathers. You know, when he says here, why do you commit this great evil against yourselves? In a sense, there's kind of like, why? God himself, he knows all things, but it's like, he just can't believe it. He said, why in the world, all right, uh, would you do this? You're not just rejecting me. You are sinning against your own self, all right? Uh, when we are foolish enough to reject God's word and rebel against his command with the devastation uh, of judgment, all right, when he, you can see what he did to those that disobeyed him, and it, for them, it had just taken place, all right? Why do you commit this great evil against yourselves? There's also a sense of wonder in the self-destructive nature of their sin. It was true that they sinned against God, but they also terribly sinned against themselves because it was going to bring disaster, all right? It was going to cut off from you man, woman, child, infant out of Judah, leaving none to remain, says you need to think about this, what you're doing. Why do you want to follow this route, all right, uh, that will end up causing everybody to have to die? And then he names it out, burning incense to other gods in the land of Egypt. Those who went to Egypt quickly began to worship the God of Egypt, gods of Egypt. Uh, the same part of idolatry that led them to sin in Judah with the Canaanite idols now led them to go after the Egyptian idols. This reveals one of the reasons God commanded them to not go down to Egypt but to trust his protection and provision in Judah, all right? God promised that he would bless and restore the exiles that went to Babylon. He promised only judgment for those who went uh, by choice to Egypt and promised that they would become a curse and a reproach, all right? So... God's word always comes to pass. I don't care if it's for good or for bad. It always comes to pass. And so he cries out to them and says, have you forgotten the wickedness? All right. The question was obvious. They had forgotten the wickedness of their fathers, their kings, their wives, especially their own wickedness. And they were going to suffer greatly for forgetting all this all right and then god answers all right and he says they have not been humbled everything that happened you would think it would humble them that they would start seeking god and repenting and saying oh god forgive us forgive us help us to listen to you and do your will but it didn't all right the remnant showed that they were neither repentant nor contrite in heart, all right? They still went on wanting their own way. Verse 11 to 14. Verses 11 to 14. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will set my face against you for evil and to cut off all Judah. And I will take the remnant of Judah that 
have set their faces to go into the land of Egypt to sojourn there. And they shall all be consumed and fall in the land of Egypt. They shall even be consumed by the sword and by the famine. They shall die from the least even unto the greatest by the sword and by the famine. And they shall be an execration and an astonishment and a curse and a reproach. For I will punish them that dwell in the land of Egypt, as I have punished Jerusalem by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence. 14. So that none of the remnants of Judah, which are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there, shall escape or remain, that they should return into the land of Judah, to the which they have a desire to return to dwell there. For none shall return, but such as for such as shall escape. So uh, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. God here again introduces himself with titles of authority and power. The Lord of hosts, all right, is the, the, the God of all the armies, whether they're natural armies, spiritual armies, the armies of the whole earth good armies, bad armies. He is the God, the Lord of hosts. He's over them all. He can dictate like how many of them, if you remember when they were coming against Judah and whoever was for Judah, like King Hezekiah that time, when he obeyed God and did what God wanted, God ended up causing the armies of those that were coming against them to turn and fight each other. And whoever heard of such a thing? You, you don't in the middle of the war turn from the one you're wanting to fight against and start killing each other. But he's the Lord of armies. In other words, he can make anybody do whatever he wants them to do. And uh, there's nothing, uh, he can cause their brain to just get all mixed up. And uh, it, it just pays to be on God's side, all right? So um, not only the God of authority and power, which is what the Lord of hosts suggests, but the God of Israel, ownership, all right? The right of ownership, all right? He said, I'm going to set my face against you, just as God before promised that he would be against Judah and not for them, and uh, against the invading Babylonians. So he would be against those who by choice exile themselves to Egypt. Now, please notice here, those who are forced to go in, God says there's no hope for them. There's going to be a few of them that went in by force, they didn't want it. They didn't want to be there. God knows those hearts, and he was going to allow them uh, to escape and get back in. If the people had made up their minds to go to Egypt and also to continue their idolatry, Yahweh had made up his mind to visit them with judgment, right? They shall die from the least to the greatest by the sword, by famine, all right? And God promised the judgment of an untimely death to those who chose Egypt over trusting God in the promised land, all right? Um, he makes it very clear that he is not referring to any permanent Jewish dwellers in Egypt. In other words, if they had gone there not as this group as the remnant but they had chosen to go down just like i've come to singapore and pretty much you know i've been here since 1955 though i haven't become a singaporean i feel like a singaporean because i've lived here so many years so god isn't talking about people that were in egypt as somebody that had uh long, long time ago, transferred, they were working there and they 
but in their heart, they love the Lord. No, he was not talking about them. He was talking about this group that had heard the word of the Lord, do not go down into Egypt, find your security. And they disobeyed and they went anyways, because he said, none are going to return. I promised that there wouldn't be, there would be very few who managed to escape the judgment of death that would come upon those who chose to find their security in Egypt rather than in the Lord, all right? Even in punishing the disobedient remnant, God still were, was going to allow a few survivors to trickle back to Judah, thereby, um, you know, because they had not disobeyed God. They were forced to go there on their own. Okay, 15 to 16, the reaction of God's people in Egypt. Verses 15 and 16. Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by, a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt, in Petros, answered Jeremiah, saying, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto thee. Boy, that, that's pretty strong words. The word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, you claim God said it, but just we want to know we're not going to listen to you. We're not going to obey it. We're not going to do what you're telling us to do. We don't accept it. It was a great multitude. All right. Uh, Jeremiah delivered this word from God to a large audience made up of most or all those who had come to Pathros, Egypt from Judah by choice or force. All right. The group included men who knew that their wives had burned incense to other gods. All right. We will not listen to you. The people knew Jeremiah spoke to them in the name of the Lord, yet they did not care. They didn't let them put, put any kind of holy fear into their heart. They, they just looked down on it. They thumbed their nose at it. That's not what we want, and we're not going to listen to you. All right. Um, they rejected the prophet, and they rejected his word, and they rejected the God who gave him that word. Their honesty was remarkable, but their sin was great. You know, to even claim that they understood it, that, and knowing that everything up until this time, whatever Jeremiah had told, he almost died for how many things and yet everything he said came to pass. You would think by then they would recognize he is a prophet of God and we better watch out if we, but they didn't really care. They didn't really, they didn't know God as God. It was more religion than anything else. I'm here to tell you religion does not give you the ability to obey, all right? Uh, it's fellowshipping with God that, and really getting him, getting to know him in a way in our personal lives that, that give us that realization that we ought to obey, all right? Jeremiah was not the suffering servant like Isaiah mentioned, Isaiah 53 talks about the suffering servant, but he was a suffering servant to the very end. All right, to the very end. So the response of the men, it, that's 17 to 18. Verses 17 to 18. 
but we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offering unto her, as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings and our princes in the cities of Judah, in the streets of Jerusalem. For then had we plenty of victors, and were well, and saw no evil. 18. But since we left off to burn incense to the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things, and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. All right. They said the men were very straightforward. They were very honest. All right. They promised to do whatever they wanted to do. We're going to do our own thing. We're going to do what pleases us, what makes sense to us. And we are not going to listen to anything else. All right. They would not let God's command or God's judgment get in the way of what they wanted to say and do. And it has to do with burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her. Uh, they spoke of the days before the fall of Jerusalem and the conquest of Ju Judah when they worshiped the Babylonian idol the queen of heaven with various rituals. They did this, their fathers did this, and the kings and princes did this all over Judah and all over Jerusalem. All right. Um, I'm, I'm just gonna do a little more and then we're gonna stop and we're going to, um, take our break. The Babylonians, the queen of heaven was a maternal deity, all right? Connected with the moon, connected with family, and connected with fertility. Um, we have to be very careful, all right? The, some observe that modern people worship the queen of heaven under other names like mother nature, feminism, and glamour, all right? But I I'm telling you, um, we, we have to be very, very careful, all right? Because the Bible does not talk about any feminine God the queen of heaven. He is king. Jesus is going to be called the king of kings, the Lord of lords. But nowhere is there given any name of a queen of heaven. And uh, we're, we're going to stop here. Uh, and then I'm, I'm going to go into it more in detail. All right. Um, they had evidently stopped worshiping and then uh, once again, now they're back down in Egypt. They're, uh, no, they had worshiped this Babylonian queen of heaven. All right, they had burnt, poured out drink offerings and done burnt offerings to her and so forth. But um, now uh, they're going to go back to it again and they give their reasons. So let's just take our break and we will come back at 10 past 10. Okay, I'm sorry about that. I did something, I don't know what I did and my whole... I lost it, so let's go to our second part now. Um, we're in chapter 44. Um,
I think we've, let, let's just read this um, so far, what we've done, all right? At the bottom of page 22, the prophet's final plea in Egypt, he reminded them of the idolatry which caused the fall of Jerusalem, the captivity to Babylon, all right? And they have not humbled themselves, but persisted in idolatry, deliberately disobeyed his law, and they will suffer the consequences. That's 11 to 14. The remnant in Egypt will be destroyed by the sword, by famine, by pestilence, and only a few fugitives will escape. All right, the remnant's rebellious response. All right, that was verse 15 to 19. The men which knew that their wives burned incense to the queen of heaven. The great multitude of women who responded in that part, all right, they said, we will not hearken to you. We will do whatever we want. All right, turn over to page 23. And at the top of the page, uh, Jeremiah's last message to Judah, uh, the queen of heaven, all right? I have put there, who is this queen of heaven, all right? In Assyria, she was known as Ishtar. The Canaanites knew her as Astarte. The Greeks knew her as Aphrodite. The Romans knew her as Venus, but nowhere is she elevated to the mother of God. She's the mother of a human being that was God come in the flesh, but he laid aside all of his godly traits. He became a human being. All right, and he was tempted in all points, just like we were, just like Adam was, but Adam fell to the temptation, whereas Jesus does not fall to the temptation. And nowhere is he called God, all right? Uh, he is in tune with God, he is in touch with God, but he was totally, completely, a human being, and that's why in all points, he was tempted like as we are, all right? Um, so, you know, I, I really don't feel like we should um, have a Queen Mary, all right? The Queen of Heaven is, it comes from the heathens. It comes from the heathens. Um, I'm going to, let's see here. As we have done, we and our fathers, our kings, our princes. Antiquity is here pleaded and authority and plenty and peace. These are now the popish pleas, all right? The pillars of that uh, religion, it is the old religion, say they, and hath potent princes for her patrons, and is practiced in Rome, the mother church. They have plenty and peace where it is professed, and where they have nothing but mass and the things that they do. These are their arguments, but they're very poor arguments, all right? Um, the Babylonians, the queen of heaven, I read that to you already, all right? Um, it is a strange and shocking thing that Roman Catholics give Mary, the mother of Jesus, this same title and direct to her improper prayer and veneration, sometimes even worse. We have to, uh,
we have no biblical permission or encouragement to have any connection with the queen of heaven. Okay, so now we're going to go over to what they claimed, all right? They claimed here, uh, we, when we used to, uh, re we remember the days when we all worshiped the queen of heaven as the good old days. This is talking about in Jeremiah's time. This is what they said. They said, we had plenty of food. We were well off and we saw no trouble. They claim that when they stopped doing all those things, they lacked everything and were consumed by the sword and by famine. All right. Um, in short, all right, the remnant claimed that idolatry had done more for them than the Lord whom Jeremiah represented. All right. Um, Because Baal worship was eradicated during Josiah's reformation, the rebellious remnant blamed all their misfortunes on this action, all right? Uh, the people, by contrast, claimed that the things went badly only when they failed to propitiate the queen of heaven. Perhaps they had in mind the long and relatively peaceful reign of Manasseh during which the non Yahwistic cults of all kinds were freely allowed. All right. Um, let's go to verse 19. Would you read that for us? Jeremiah 44 verse 19. And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven, and pour out drink offerings unto her? Did we make her cakes to worship her? And pour out our pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? All right. So uh what the women say, they admitted that they played an important part in the worship of the Babylonian Queen of Heaven and other idols, all right, but they tried to make their husbands responsible for their sin, all right, in the sense that they said they didn't stop us. In fact, they helped us out. In fact, they were partially in on it, all right? But we see here that, you know, in the first sin, the man also blamed his wife for his sin. Here in the women of Judah and Egypt, they return the favor, all right? They do the same thing. They turn and blame their husbands for it. Um, all right. Jeremiah answers the people, 20 to 23. Verses 20 to 23. Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, to the men and to the women, and to all the people which had given him that answer, saying, the incense that you burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings and your princes and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them and came it not into his mind? So that the Lord could no longer bear because of evil, because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which you have committed. Therefore is the is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as at this day. All right. So Jeremiah tried to reason with the people. All right. Uh, they had completely left God out of their thinking and out of their reasoning. They felt that if they ignored God, then he somehow did not matter. Yet the Lord did matter. Remaining the God of Israel, if they rejected him or not, he saw and remembered their sins and their idolatry. You know, uh, a lot of people have this idea 
they they get their own religion, they get their own ideas, and they have their own ideas of what God is like and what he will allow and what he won't allow. And no, we cannot know God except we know the word of God, which tells and then except we accept Jesus Christ, who through his Holy Spirit will open the eyes of our understanding. I want you to just stop for a moment and think of a couple things. Do you remember in the time of one of the prophets and um, the Lord kept showing this prophet what the enemy was going to do? And then he would tell the king of Israel and uh, they, they would prepare ahead of time. And of course, always gain the victory or get out of the situation. So this king of the, uh, the enemy's king says, who is telling him these things? And he sends his army to surround the, the city where the prophet was living. The prophet's servant saw all of the horsemen and he said, oh, my master, what are we going to do? They've surrounded us. And the prophet prayed and said, Lord, open his eyes to see into the realm of the spirit. And when he opened his eyes, suddenly he saw around the natural army was a heavenly army. All right, much bigger, much greater uh, and stronger. And when the servant saw it, then he realized he saw what God saw and he quieted down and realized that victory was theirs. Uh, you know, that, that on several occasions, when God opens the spiritual eyes to see what he sees, then they understand why God says what he says. And we need to pray that. Do not rely on our natural understanding. Do not rely on what we see with our eyes, but rely on what the Lord says in his word, all right? And so he, he told them here, um, the Lord, he did not, you, you might have ignored him and rejected him or not. He saw and he remembers your sins and idolatry and he could no longer bear it. He was patient with his disobedient people, but they chose to take his patience to mean he didn't care and he wasn't going to do anything about it. He did care and he brought judgment against them. Therefore, this calamity has happened to you all right uh read verses 24 to 29 verses 24 to 29 moreover jeremiah said unto all the people and to all the women hear the word of the lord all judah that are in the land of egypt thus saith the lord of hosts the god of israel saying ye and your wives have both spoken with your mouths and fulfilled with your hands saying we will surely perform our vows that we have vowed to burn incense to the queen of heaven and to pour out drink offerings unto her. Ye will surely accomplish your vows and surely perform your vows. Therefore, hear ye the word of the Lord, all Judah and, the, and that dwell in the land of Egypt. Behold, I have sworn by my great name, saith the Lord that my name shall no more be named in the mouth of any man of Judah in all the land of Egypt, saying, The Lord God liveth. Behold, I will watch over them for evil and not for good. And all the men of Judah that are in the land of Egypt shall be consumed by the sword and by the famine until there be an end of them. Yet a small number that escaped the sword shall return out of the land of Egypt into the land of Judah. 
and all the remnant of Judah that are gone into the land of Egypt to sojourn there shall know whose words shall stand, mine or theirs. Shall right. I read the next song? Did, did you read 29? Uh, no, not yet. Shall Go I? ahead. Yes. Mm -hmm. Verse 29. And this shall be a sign unto you, saith the Lord, that I will punish you in this place, that you may know that my words shall surely stand against you for evil. Yeah. Okay. So once again, here in this passage that we just read, God spoke to his people with those titles of power, authority, which is the, thus saith the Lord of hosts, and ownership, the God of Israel. Chronologically speaking, this was probably Jeremiah's last recorded prophecy. He ended as he started, faithful to God, all right, trusting in God's faithfulness. So, uh, you know, he's, he's, Jeremiah quoted the people in their promise to continue worshiping the Queen of Heaven and other idols. It was a declaration that God heard their defiance very clearly, all right, in a powerful expression of irony and revulsion, Jeremiah tells the enemy, tells the remnant to proceed with fulfilling their godless vows. He may have been pointing to their incense and libations and to the very cakes that they were carrying. But he said, this is what God has to say to you. God solemnly declared he rejected those who rejected him, those who chose to go to Egypt, those who trusted idols more than him. He would not allow them to ever speak of his name again. And when it says here, I will watch over them for adversity. You know, when you say watch over them, it's like you get the idea of protection. But no, he said, I'm going to keep my eyes on them, all right, for adversity and not for good. My watching over them, I'm going to make sure that bad things come to them, that the curse comes upon them, that death and so forth, it comes upon them. All right, God had commanded them to stay in the land of Judah and trust him that he would watch over them to protect him, to provide. But by rejecting God and his promise, they would still have God watching over them, but it would be for adversity, for bad things, bad happenings, and not for good. This was a terrifying promise. Knowing that God is the best friend, all right, but... He is the worst enemy anybody could have. If he's our friend, it's a wonderful thing that we have him on our side. He will do mighty things for us. He will watch over us. He will do whatever it takes. But if he is our enemy, that is scary. And they chose to make God their enemy. All right. He says here, God promised. If they persisted in these sins, only a remnant would escape the judgment that they were going to face in Egypt. The rest would be consumed by the sword and by famine. And this was going to prove true. God's terrible promise to watch over them for adversity. All right. Um, read verse 30. Verse 30. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will give Pharaoh, Hophra, king of Egypt, into the hand of his enemies, and into the hand of them that seek his life. As I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, his enemy, and that sought his life. All right. Now, I, I want you to notice this, because I didn't catch it myself. I... I found this um, David Guzik who tells this, all right, um, 
it says, I will give Pharaoh Hophra, that's the Pharaoh that was in Egypt at that time, into the hand of his enemies. It doesn't say into the hand of Jeremiah. You'll notice Zedekiah was given into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, I've, sorry, I, I said the wrong name there. All right. It doesn't say that Pharaoh Hophra would be given into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. All right. It says it will be given into the hands of his enemies. All right. Uh, God promised that Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon would come against Egypt. Here, Jeremiah gave a more specific prophecy of that assured event. Hophra was actually overthrown by Amasis, one of his own officers, who revolted against him and then shared rule with him. All right. Amasis rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar in 517 and was defeated in 568. So 16 years after the fall of Jerusalem, Hophra was dethroned and strangled by some of his subjects. Again, Jeremiah is right on, you know, he doesn't say, I'm going to have Nebuchadnezzar come and kill him. No, he says he will be destroyed by his enemies. And his death was proved, all right, that it was not by Nebuchadnezzar uh, coming there, but rather by those of his own enemies, some of his own subjects, all right? He was dethroned and strangled by them. So they were his personal enemies, but they were not Nebuchadnezzar. I, I tell you, God's word is so clear and so specific. He said, as I gave Zedekiah, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, just like it happened to Zedekiah, it would happen to Pharaoh. God's judgments would prove to be true. All right. Jeremiah did not specify that Hophra would fall into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, but merely into the hands of his enemy. Just as Zedekiah lost his life, so would Pharaoh Hophra. All right. Now, we're going to do chapter 45. All right. Um, give me a moment here to turn to it. This is a short chapter. All right. It only has five verses. But there's a lot in these five verses, so it's not going to take us a long time, but we will stick with it till it's done, even if I go over time, because uh, when we start next week with chapter 46, uh, it's prophecies concerning the nations. It changes. Uh, it's Jeremiah giving prophecies about the neighboring nations. Uh, it's actually finished as far as Judah is concerned. Jeremiah's message to Baruch is recalled. All right. Um, would you please read number one? Jeremiah 45 verse 1. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spake unto Baruch the son of Nerea when he had written these words in a book at the mouth of Jeremiah, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying. All right. Now, um, this was the long time we're talking who Baruch is, all right? Um, because we haven't talked for him about him for a while. The long time trusted associate of Jeremiah. Baruch was the scribe or the pen man to the prophet having written these words in a book at the instruction of jeremiah later both jeremiah and baruch were taken into egypt against their will we're told here in the fourth year of jehoiakim wow remember i told you at the beginning jeremiah 
just does not always go chronologically. Uh, sometimes it's in Zedekiah's time, sometimes it's Jehoiakim's time. Here at the very end, suddenly he, he goes back, all right? Chronological order was not important to the one who arranged the book of Jeremiah. The previous chapters in this section dealt with the time later after the fall of Jerusalem and Judah. This chapter deals with a time many years before that catastrophe. It's something like a flashback in a film or a novel. All right, verses two and three. Verses two and three. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, unto thee, O Baruch. Thou didst say, Woe is me now, for the Lord hath added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sighing, and I find no rest. Okay. Um, as a faithful partner with Jeremiah, Baruch had to endure a lot of opposition and abuse. And he certainly suffered much for his faithfulness to God and to Jeremiah. He therefore felt that God could in some way be blamed for his grief and sorrow. Uh, sometimes we're like that and we, God, you claim you can do anything. You claim you know everything. Why did you let this happen? We have to be very, very careful that we don't turn and try to uh, put blame on God, all right? God is nothing but love, and he only allows things to happen for our own good, all right? Um, so note the self-centeredness of his attitude indicated by the five personal pronouns in verse Three. All right. Woe is me, for the Lord God hath added grief to my sorrow. I fainted in my sign, and I find no rest. Five times that personal um, pronoun. All right. It's the same number in the Pharisees' self congratulatory prayer Luke 18 11 would you read that to us Luke 18 verse 11 then Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself God I thank thee that I'm not as other men are extortioners unjust adulterers or even as this publican so it's the same thing as the Pharisee when he prayed, and the Bible tells us he prayed to himself. God didn't even accept it. It didn't even go as far as the ceiling, all right? Um, I, I'm so glad that I'm not like this other guy, and I'm not like other people, and I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I don't do the other. It was all me, 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 and how good I am but God never accepted, all right? So for this Baruch, the emphasis in his lamentation was placed on the word me. Woe is me now, all right? Um, the fact that God knew what Baruch said and spoke to him about it is really something a bit sobering, all right? God heard and responded to Baruch's accusation of unbelief against him. I fainted in my sign. I find no rest. Uh, Baruch was exhausted, probably both physically and spiritually. He felt that God had not blessed or protected him as he had hoped. All right. Uh, if you remember back in the days when this came about, all right, in the fourth year of, who, who is the king? Jehoiakim, all right. 
do, do you remember when Jehoiakim cut the, the, the writing, which he had written it all, but Jeremiah had spoken it. Jeremiah spoke it, and this one would write it down. And that those pages that he had written were cut and burned. And then, you know, the king said, go and get Jeremiah and Baruch. They were like put together, all right? They're one in this whole thing. Uh, and he wanted to kill them. But the Bible tells us that God hid them. Well, he seems to have forgotten that God hid them and he wasn't killed at that time because other prophets had been killed, all right? But um, let, let's read verse four. Go, going back to this. Um, verse four of Jeremiah 45. Thus shalt thou say unto him, The Lord saith thus, Behold, that which I have built will I break down, and that which I have planted I will pluck up, even this whole land. All right. So uh, Baruch was used to writing out what God spoke to Jeremiah for others, not for himself. But here God had a word for his discouraged exhausted servant and here the lord speaks of his power he said what i have built i will break down what i've planted i will pluck up even this whole land so god spoke to baruch about his great power and his great power expressed in judgment i have the power to build i have the power to tear down and this reminded baruch of the power and authority of God to do as he pleased. And it also put some of Baruch's perceived problems into perspective. He was discouraged, exhausted. Much worse was coming on the whole land. All he was thinking of was of himself. He's, God is reminding Baruch here, I'm not done with my judgment, all right, on Jerusalem and Judah. There is more to come until it's complete. The whole land is going to be. Remember, we're going back in time to Jehoiakim's time. All right. Um, so Jeremiah had to remind Baruch of God's own sorrow. All right. At what was to happen. Yahweh had built something and was about to destroy it. He planted and was about to uproot it. Verses 5 to 6. Verses 5 to 6. Uh, verses 5. And seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. For behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord. But thy life will I give unto thee for a prey in all places whither thou goest. Do you seek great things for yourself? Apparently, some of Baruch's discouragement and exhaustion came from seeking great things for himself. He expected to be at a better, different place in his life than where he found himself at that time, which, remember, we are going back to um, the time when Jehoiakim was in office all right Baruch was an educated man qualified as a secretary whose brother this is Jeremiah 51 we haven't got there yet was an officer of high rank under Zedekiah and he may have entertained hopes of some distinction in the nation whatever great things he sought for himself were forfeited by his loyal support. The dis disappointment of great things sought and unfulfilled weighed heavily on him, all right? But God turns Baruch away. He, God tells him, do not seek them. 
all right, from the path of self-exaltation. God wanted Baruch to have the right mindset, not obsess or overly concerned about his own advancement and perceived success. God used this word to Baruch to speak to many throughout the centuries, all right? I'm going to tell you two stories here. Uh, one is by about Dr. J. Oswald Sanders. He coveted a certain job in a Christian organization. He almost lobbied some influential friends for it. But walking through downtown Auckland, New Zealand, these words came to him with authority. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek thou not. Consequently, he didn't seek the position. But it later opened to him on its own in God's timing. So we see God spoke to him. He wasn't reading the Bible. He was walking, all right, and God just spoke those words out of Jeremiah to him, all right? Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. Let God give them to you. Don't go out of your way to try to get something because it will better you. It'll give you more money. It'll make give you more reputation. And leave God to do all that. We are his we are for him and to be his all right this is about charles spurgeon when charles spurgeon was 18 he applied to regents park college an interview was set and spurgeon rose early and set out remember he's only 18 years old but through a misunderstanding he missed his appointment, and therefore he was not admitted. Bitterly disappointed, Charles Spurgeon walked through the countryside, trying to calm himself down. Suddenly, Jeremiah 45, 5 came to mind. Seest thou, seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. Spurgeon never made it to college, but he went on to become the most effective preacher in England. You know, it could be had he gone to that college, he would have come out with some wrong ideas. He never got there and ended up, you know, reading the word of God for itself and God's spirit teaching him as he went along. And he became the most effective preacher in England, all right? Here, God is reminding Baruch that one day he would bring judgment on all flesh. You know, worldly power, popularity, and prestige will then be swept away. This should make us less concerned about great things like fame and popularity. We have eternity to deal with, all right? Uh, so don't seek a name for yourself. A place of importance and distinction is to look for the wrong thing in the wrong place, to seek social media greatness or internet Notoriety shows a lack of appreciation for the God who will bring adversity on all flesh. All right, Philippians twice describes a bad kind of ambition, implying that there is a good kind of ambition. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition. So there is a self-centered ambition, all right? Uh, and this is what Paul says. They were even, these people were preaching Christ, but from a selfish ambition. Uh, 
uh, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. All right. Uh, we could say that Paul was an ambitious man. Peter was an ambitious man. All right. But their ambitions was for God's glory and God's fame. And we may seek great things, but God's great things always, all right, uh, we need to remember what God says in Luke 14, 11. Would you read that for us, please? Yes. Just a moment. Luke 14, verse 11. For whosoever exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Yeah. So we're, we don't want to have selfish ambitions. Uh, when, when we're tempted that way, cast it down and say, Lord, I, I don't want this pride, because it comes from pride. Pride of self, all right? And say, Lord, I want to humble myself. Because if we will humble ourselves and listen to what the Lord has to say, God will lift us up. And we need to learn from God's word to Baruch. Instead of exalting ourselves, we need to exalt Jesus. We may long to make a big impact on the world but be perfectly satisfied if our name remain, remains unknown in doing so. Uh, what does God say? I will give your life to you as a prize. Wherever you go, God's assurance to Baruch was strong. He would take care of him. Even when he was later taken to Egypt with Jeremiah, this promise was sure to care for Baruch wherever he may go. Your life to you as a prize, all right? Uh, you, he was, it, it's like a soldier barely escaping with his life after a defeat in battle, all right? So we're gonna stop here, all right? Ironically, the very suffering through which Baruch passed because of his loyalty to Jeremiah, gained him honor beyond anything he could have anticipated, all right? Because down through the years, thousands of people have read the book of Jeremiah and they know about Baruch and they see him, whereas many other people who lived in that day and age their name is long forgotten. Nobody even remembers it. Though he doesn't see it, he rose to notoriety because God allowed it to be so. Isn't that right? That name Baruch means blessed. All right. Um, never yet did anyone do or suffer aught for God's sake that complained of a hard bargain. In the end, all right, it's obvious when Baruch arranged Jeremiah's scroll, he put this prophecy right where it belonged. He treasured the promise God gave him. It reminded him of the way God answered him in his despair. So he put it here at the end of his life to show that God was faithful to his promise. All right. Um, we will close for now and come back next week, Tuesday, where we will pick up the book of Numbers. But Saturday, we will start with chapter 46. Father, while every head is bowed and every eye is closed, I pray that you're going to speak to us, Lord. When we come to you, it's a brand new life. It's the life of Christ. Christ. We're put into Christ. We become part of Christ. 
And no longer are we to live to ourselves. No longer are we to live to gain selfish gain. But we are alive for the glory and for the honor of Jesus and to lift the name of God up. I thank you, Jesus. I praise you. May we ever be reminded, Lord, don't seek gain for yourself, but seek the will of God. Don't seek to be known of people, but rather to be known of God. Let God lift us up. Let God put us up. Let God use us for his glory and for his honor. Lord, anyone that's listening today, may we take this to heart and ask you to humble us and make sure that our lives are in lowliness of heart and mind, just like Jesus, and follow his ways, not my will, but thy will be done. Thank you, Jesus. In thy name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Rita. Thank each and every one of you for showing up today. God bless you. Amen. Bye.